Welcome to the Musical Center for the Arts. Take a moment and locate the nearest emergency exit to your seating area. Thank you. Welcome to uh, this evening's conversation with Greg Boyle. Uh, I've known him longer than I know anyone else in this room. Uh, and this conversation with Greg is the latest in a series of annual talks sponsored by the University Honors Program and always supported by the president of Chapman University, Daniel Strupa. This evening's conversation is entitled, A Faith That Does Justice. It must be admitted up front, however, that this title is not at all original. As a matter of fact, it was the theme of the fourth decree of the 32nd General Congregation of the Society of Jesus. This decree basically states that the promotion of religious faith is inextricably intertwined with the promotion of and the struggle for social justice. It therefore should not be at all surprising that Greg Boyle, who entered the Society of Jesus two years before that seminal 32nd General Congregation and is a priest in that religious order, would be prompted to undertake the kind of work he has been doing for so many years in his home city of Los Angeles. We gather here this evening to hear Greg give some account of his work, and he will do so after he is introduced by one of the governors of Chapman University, Bob Barry who, if I am correct, attended high school with Greg and has been his friend and a supporter of his work ever since. But adequately grasping the significance of Greg's work requires some understanding of its historical and social context, which I will attempt to give in very brief and broad strokes. Let me say at the beginning that one must be either deeply asleep or quite comfortably complacent or have an extremely hard heart not to give a damn about a horrible drama which has race and poverty as its central themes and which has had a long run on the stage of US history. This horror show, built on abuse and rancor and guilt, has been stoked by many forms of institutional racism, evident in education, in employment, in health care, in housing, in lawmaking, in policing, in voting, in the school to prison pipeline, in the denial of basic human rights to ex-prisoners. All of these have played significant roles in the appeal of urban gang membership, in the grossly disproportionate incarceration of poor people of color, and in the high rates of recidivism. Any genuine promotion of and struggle for social justice must obviously work to alleviate the horrendous consequences of institutional racism. But it must also, at the same time, work to dismantle its root causes. Whenever anyone works to alleviate only those consequences, 
by constantly cleaning up the perpetual mess of institutional racism, they are called all kinds. They are called kind and generous. They are called good and saintly. However, whenever they work also to dismantle its root causes by working to stop that mess from happening in the first place, they are called all sorts of names, but rarely the ones their parents gave them. The late Archbishop uh, of Recife, Brazil, Don Elda Camara, knew this dilemma quite well. He was informally called the Bishop of the Slums because of his preferential option for the urban poor. And he once famously remarked, when I feed the poor, they call me a saint. But when I ask why the poor are hungry, they call me a communist. This evening, I am eager to hear of Greg's work with the urban poor and people of color, caught up in the snares of economic injustice and in the spiraling hellhole of the prison industrial complex a complex of which Michelle Alexander gives a staggering account in her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Her book is by any account, a timely and stunning guide to the labyrinth of propaganda, discrimination, and racist policies often masquerading under other names that comprise what is called justice and freedom in a country founded on admirable political principles, principles which, however, were tainted from the very beginning because they were also used to promote and to mask the genocide, the exclusion, and the oppression of so many inhabitants of this land. This evening, I am eager to hear how Greg threads that delicately fine needle once threaded by Don Elder Camera, by showing both how his faith that does justice works to alleviate the crippling consequences of institutional racism in the economic and prison systems of the United States, and also how his faith that does justice works to dismantle their root causes. The order of this evening's event is as follows. First, Bob Barry will introduce Greg Boyle, after which Daniele Strupa, on behalf of Chapman University, will confer an honorary doctorate in humane letters upon Greg. That conferral will be followed by a short video before this evening's keynote address and the question and answer period after. At the end of the Q&A, Greg will briefly sign copies of his book in the lobby. Bob Barry. Thank you very much, Carmichael. <clears throat> it's uh, really uh, exciting to be here at uh, Chapman University to honor our great friend, uh, Father Greg Boyle. Uh, Roberta, my wife, and I are happy to have no nominated uh, Father Greg uh, for this uh, honorary uh, degree. Uh, Greg, or many people know him as G, has dedicated his life with a keen focus on faith and family. Both the family he was born into, which is a wonderful family, and the family that God has sent into his life. The hundreds of thousands of gang members and family members have become his family in a, a true and deep way. This evening's event also supports our love of uh, Chapman University. Our family loves Chapman, and we're, we're, it's where our daughter uh, Megan 
uh, who's here tonight uh, earned uh, two master's degrees. Uh, Megan's here with, uh, tonight with her wonderful husband, Brian. And uh, another, our, our other daughter, Jane, uh, went to Boston College and uh, often was, <coughs> had the fortunate uh, uh, time with uh, Father G being his uh, chauffeur from the uh, airport to uh, give speeches there. And uh, they've become good friends and uh, they do a lot of uh, texting uh, um, uh, uh, together. <coughs> Chapman is also a place where we treasure our friendship uh, with Daniele, uh, Lisa, and their family. I met uh, Daniele at uh, Zove's uh, years ago, and it's grown into a wonderful uh, friendship. Uh, so it's, it's just wonderful that uh, Daniele uh, has such enthusiasm and support for this, uh, this evening. Uh, Father Greg and I met at Loyola High School, and I know it's going to be very hard for you to believe uh, this coming year we'll have our 50th Loyola High reunion. I know we don't even look 50. <laughs> uh, Greg has been there with our family during our most cherished moments, uh, as well as life's key challenges, lifting our spirits and love. Our families go way back. Uh, Greg's mother was actually a bridesmaid in uh, our son-in-law Brian's uh, uh, grandparents' wedding. Uh, so it goes back 70 plus years. Uh, Father Greg leverages his loving upbringing education and open heart, helping hundreds of thousands of gang members, their families, and really everyone he meets. He's just a phenomenal guy. Uh, Greg embodies his Jesuit education, uh, famous for its dedication uh, and the motto, men and women for others. I think his whole life uh, embodies that uh, wonderful motto, motto, men and women for others, and really anyone that really gets to know Greg em, uh, embraces that, whether they went to a Jesuit uh, community or not. Uh, but when you're with him, he listens intensely. He has this massive compassion. Uh, it overtakes him, and nothing else in the world matters. At that moment, you feel his understanding and the fullest attention. And if you uh, ever have the fortune to go by Homeboy, the massive number of gang members and employees and people in the cafe. But if uh, Greg is talking to you, he's talking to you. Um, our main motivation uh, for Greg's nomination is to enlighten you with you, yours as, your, um, as you hear Father Greg Boyle tonight um, and his stories of uh, Homeboy uh, with a touching message. Uh, he, so listen carefully. Really listen carefully tonight. Read his powerful books. I'm, I'm about to finish his third wonderful one. Uh, uh, visit Homegirl Cafe, Homeboy uh, Cafe at LAX, uh, and uh, uh, really uh, take a look at the, the, the uh, different services. They have a wonderful uh, Homeboy electronic recycling service, and one of their reps are here tonight you might meet. And really, at the core of all of this tonight, I, I'm hoping uh, you all will uh, look at uh, a very special thing for us is our granddaughter uh, sings enthusiastically, be kind to everyone. And that's really what uh, Greg is all about. So I would like to now ask President Strupa to formally confer the honorary degree to Father Greg Boyle. Thank you, Bob. Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, first of all, my pleasure to welcome you, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's going to be a truly wonderful evening, and I'm so happy to see you all back in our marvelous Musco Center. The center without the audience is, is not alive, and so thank you for being here tonight. I would like to ask uh, Father Boyle and Dr. Carmichael to step at the center of the, of the stage. Uh, Father Boyle, it is with uh, great admiration and pride that Chapman University honors your inspirational life of service to others. Your work has been instrumental in creating transformational possibilities in marginalized communities. I, you have to wait, I'm not done. <laughs> so, we have known each other for a long time, but he ne still never listened to me, my friend. <laughs> uh, 
between the founding of Homeboy Industry and the creation of Global Homeboy Network, you have built social enterprises through which people have actively transformed their lives and their communities. Your courageous and relentless work embodies Chapman spirit and values, and you are an inspiration to us all. And therefore, by the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Chapman University, I hereby confer upon you, Father Greg Boyle, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters with all the honors there on to Pertoni. Congratulations. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. For you have decided to go from here and to allow other voices to be heard. I'm missing that goofy hat already. <laughs> Feeling naked without it. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, President Stroop. I'm honored to be here uh, in this community. I've known uh, Carmichael uh, Peters uh, since 1974 and Bob Berry since 1968, and uh, privileged to know them both. Privileged to have uh, battled traffic to get here. I think we left on Tuesday. I'm not mistaken, and I know I uh, caused some, uh, as we say in Spanish, a paro cardiaco for, uh, for uh, all, all involved, but traveled with my friend Chris, and who I've known for a long time, who is in town from Vancouver, and two homies, JC and Raquan. And Marcos, are you here? Yeah, here. There you are. Yeah, Marcos and Laura. Good. Uh, so it's a real privilege uh, to be with you. You know, uh, Bob mentioned my new book, uh, The Whole Language, which just came out last week or two weeks ago, I guess. And, and you know, it's my third book. So I was just kind of hoping that it wouldn't be, you know, Godfather 3, you know, and uh, <laughs> so just hoping it doesn't suck, you know, <laughs> like Godfather 3, you know. And, <laughs> And, but it's funny, I was on a plane uh, from LA uh, to DC just uh, a couple days ago. I just got in from Boston yesterday and, and I was walking back to my seat and, uh, from the restroom and I see a guy, sit, uh, there's somebody sitting at the aisle and the tray table is down and I noticed the distinctive turquoise color of, the, of my third book. And I, I look and I go, oh my gosh, somebody's reading my book on the plane. And I turn to look at the guy, <laughs> <laughs> totally not drooling, babas, the whole thing. And so I'm just doing my part, you know, for insomnia in the United States. <laughs> A homie told me once, uh, Luis Perez, uh, who uh, liked to give talks, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. and he. He said, you know, you gotta pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> and I said, yeah, no shit. That's, <laughs> that is good advice right there. And 
So those earlier things about my book, that was, you know, self-defecating, so just so that you know. You know, Chapman, you know, is uh, for students, certainly, uh, what Martin Luther King used to say about church could well be uh, said about your time here at Chapman. It's not the place you've come to, it's the place you go from. And you go from here and you try to imagine something different. You try to imagine and foster and nurture and create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. You try to imagine a circle of compassion and then you try to imagine nobody standing outside that circle. You go from here to make these choices to stand at the margins because that's the only way that they've ever gotten erased is when we stand out at them. And you look under your feet and you see this happening. And you stand with a particularity with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless and you stand with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while, you get this privilege to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. You get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And you stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And the hope is that you will create a place of kinship and connection. What the great John Lewis says, we all live in the same house. He doesn't say, well, you know, some people live on the third floor and some live in the basement. He doesn't make it aspirational. He doesn't say, you know, one day we might all live no, he says it straight out. It's a declarative sentence. We all live in the same house. And that's the hope. And I suspect if kinship happened to be our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We would be celebrating it. And so we brace ourselves because we all know that folks will accuse you of wasting your time at the margins. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, for in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And so you go to the margins and other voices get heard. I suppose, I think, on some level, none of this makes any sense if our God is puny and exacting and made in our image. But the hope is that we bump into the God who loves us without measure and without regret. My friend Mirabai Starr, who's a mystic and writes about mystics, uh, always says, once you know the God of love, you fire all the other gods which of course is sort of the task. Uh, you want to kind of find this spacious and expansive God that has room for everybody so that we can be in the world who God is and then we can experience the tender glance of this God and then we can choose to be that tender glance in the world. You know, I, for uh, 37 years I've worked with gang members and during all that time I've I've celebrated uh, the Eucharist and done Catholic services at uh, detention facilities, juvenile halls and probation camps and jails. And I was at San Fernando Juvenile Hall once and, uh, you know, I was vested. I had my Albon and my stole and I was up on kind of a raised platform sitting on a folding chair. And there were like 500 gang members mainly in this gym. And one by one, the homies would come up and do the readings, the first reading, the responsorial psalm, the second reading. And, you know, they had these sheets that had the readings in English and, and Spanish. And so, you know, you do this sometimes when you preside. You just say, 
close your eyes and listen to the word proclaimed. And so I did, and I had the sheet resting on my lap, and I listened to the first guy do the first reading, and then the next guy got up to do the responsorial psalm, and there seemed to be an overabundance of confidence in his voice, and he got up and he said, the Lord is exhausted. <laughs> and I said, what the hell? And it was, the Lord is exalted. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, that's way better. <laughs> because the exalted God, you know, is created in our own image, you know. But the exhausted God is, is entirely different. And we know what that's like to find the joy in our true selves in loving and being extensive, being anchored in the other person. This is where the joy is. This is not some grim duty. This is where the joy is. And so we choose to be in the world who God is. And we want to uh, be extensive about that and as spacious and expansive as the God we actually have. So uh, Homeboy Industries was kind of born in that context, I suppose, in 1988 when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission, and it was uh, located, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. At the time, it was the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi, and we had eight gangs at war with each other, which is not typical anywhere in public housing. And I buried, and according to the LAPD, it was the place of the highest concentration of gang activity anywhere was my parish. And so consequently, I buried my first uh, young person killed because of the sadness in 1988. And uh, two weeks ago, I buried my 253rd. Not all from that community, but I run a large gang intervention program, and so I get asked to do that. So the first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many middle school, junior high age gang members who had gotten the boot from their homeschool. Nobody wanted them. And so they were wreaking havoc in the projects. They were writing on the walls. They were uh, selling drugs. They were violent. So I walked out to them and I would kind of isolate them one at a time. And I'd say, hey, if I found you a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, every single one said, yeah, you know, I would. And then I, I couldn't find a school that would take them. You know, it kind of forced my hand a little bit. And so across the street from the church is our elementary school. And uh, the first two floors, uh, grades K to 8. But th then the entire third floor was the convent. And so one evening I gathered all the nuns in their living room and I sat them down and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out and, uh, <laughs> and we could turn the convent into a school, you know, for gang members. And they looked at each other and they said, sure. <laughs> and that was the sum total of their entire discernment process. And, and so we were off and running and so um, that brought, uh, gang members in large numbers to the church property. And uh, that created something of a disconnect. I remember parishioners would sidle up to me and say, hey, you know, um, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out, you know, which was a good gospel challenge. <laughs> and then the gang members said, if only we had jobs. And so myself and the women, in the parish was mainly women were, were the drivers of everything. We marched around the factories that surrounded the housing projects trying to find felony friendly employers and that wasn't so forthcoming. And so um, then I just started things, you know, like a, a maintenance crew, a landscaping crew, a, a graffiti removal crew, uh, a crew uh, to build our child care center, all made up of rival enemy gang members from the eight gangs in the parish. 
Then in 1992, some of you may recall, after the Rodney King verdict, the whole uh, city of Los Angeles exploded. Every pocket of poverty ignited, except the poorest pocket, Dolores Mission. And so the LA Times wanted to know why that was. And I said, well, I don't know, but maybe it's partly due to the fact that we had 60 strategically hired rival enemy gang members who had a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gangbang the night before and more to the point of your question, a reason not to torch their own community. So the article appeared in LA Times and a movie producer named Ray Stark who happened to have $500 million summoned me the next day to his Beverly Hills office and, and he said, how should I you know, spend my money? And, and as I look back on it, I, I can see that I woefully undershot my request, but <laughs> I was young, I had hair, and I, and I said, well, you know, where there's an abandoned bakery across the street from the school, you, you could buy it, and it has ovens, they don't work, but you could fix them, and I don't know, we could put hair nets on rival gang members, and they could bake bread, and I don't know, we could call the place Homeboy Bakery. And that was the total extent of my business plan, you know. And, and he said sure, and then we were off and running. A, a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market, and once we had plural, we changed our name, which we previously called ourselves Jobs for a Future. And then we changed it to Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this, you know. And, and not everything worked, you know, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy plumbing really was not hugely successful. Uh, <laughs> who knew? Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I mean, I <laughs> did not see that coming. <laughs> and then nobody ever intends to do such a thing, but we evolved. We backed our way now into becoming uh, the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on the planet. And so. <laughs> so 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors trying to reimagine their lives. And uh, the centerpiece, of course, is our 18-month training program. And people get paid to work there and to work on themselves. Every gang member comes through the doors with what a psychologist would call a disorganized attachment. Mom was either frightened or frightening, and you can't really calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. Every gang member walks through those doors barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace. And the only thing that can actually scale that wall is tenderness, is choosing to be in the world who God is. Tender glance meets tender glance. If it's true that the traumatized may well find their way to causing trauma, it's equally true that the cherished will be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and each other. The homies often say that at, at, you know, the, at Homeboy that they're used to being watched, but they're not used to being seen and so we want to see people. The Buddhists say, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. We want to see people when they walk through the doors. The Christmas carol says, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And yet it's a song about Christmas and yet it's about Jesus. But how is it not the job description of every one of us? You appear, and the soul feels its worth. I had a homie in uh, Houston after a talk I gave. He was uh, working as what we call in the biz a hardcore gang intervention worker and had been to prison. Now he was working with gang members. And he kind of pleaded with me after the talk with very earnest. He says, how do you reach them? And I found myself saying, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Can you receive who they are? 
can you allow your heart to be altered by them? None of us go to the margins to make a difference. We go to the margins so that the folks at the margins will make me different. You don't go to the margins to save or rescue or fix, because then it's, if I do that, it's about me. But if you go there to receive and to be reached, then it's about us. It's about exquisite mutuality. One of the great uh, privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend. And as, uh, as Bob was suggesting about listening, it, he was the best listener I've ever been in the pres presence of. If you were in his presence, exactly nobody else existed but you. He was laser beam focused. And uh, once a reporter famously commented to him, and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual, which of course is the goal. How do you reach this sense of mutuality so that the soul can feel its worth? So at Homeboy, you know, we have uh, therapy and we have uh, classes and we have 10 uh, social enterprises. Again, we're rival enemy gang members work side by side with each other. We have free tattoo removal, no place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do. And we have three laser machines and I don't know what it is, 10,000 uh, treatments a year or something. And it was all started because of a guy named Frank who uh, I didn't know and he was uh, just a few days out of Corcoran State Prison and he's sitting in front of my desk and, and he tattooed on his forehead and pardon my French, but it filled the entire forehead. It, it said, fuck the world from here to here to here to here. Filled the hole with big black block letters. And he says, you know, I'm having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> and I said, well, Frank, uh, you know, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. And <laughs> so naturally, I hired him, and he baked bread. But I, I went looking for a doctor who had a laser machine to help out Frank, you know. And, and I found one at White Memorial Hospital, Dr. Jack Lenore. And, uh, and he said, I'll give you one hour a month. And so he chipped away at Frank's forehead and like five other guys. And within a few months, I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members all wanting this service. So we couldn't stay with that arrangement. In parentheses, Frank is a security guard at a movie studio at the moment. And there is no trace left of the angriest, dumbest thing he had ever done in his life. <laughs> I'll tell him you said so. And <laughs> proving once and for all that all of us are a whole lot more than the worst things we've ever done. And uh, more than anything, you want homies to become resilient and you want them to come to terms and if they don't transform their pain, they'll just keep transmitting it. And everybody uh, holds a piece, as we always say at Homeboy. It's the relationship that heals from the homies who are security guards to, uh, to the homies who are present here this evening. All of you hold a piece and all of you participate in cherishing people and then the homies encounter homeboy as a sanctuary and then they become the sanctuary that they sought and then they go home and they provide that sanctuary to their kids and for the first time you've broken a cycle. But the task always is to uh, dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way that keep people from seeing their truth At Homeboy, we're kind of allergic to holding the bar up and asking folks to measure up. Instead, we hold the mirror up and we say, here's your truth. 
You don't have to become something that you're not. You have to remember who you are. Oh, nobly born, you are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. The great scripture scholar Marcus Borg says that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace, and I think that's quite true. In the Acts of the Apostles, it has a very odd line, and it says simply, and awe came upon everyone. And it suggests that the measure of health in any community at all, including this one, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. A number of years ago, uh, I was invited to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia. It was what they call in the biz, a gang in service. And so from nine to five, social workers commandeer a hotel ballroom and everybody signs in and gets credits and there are workshops and breakout sessions and keynotes and all to help social workers understand the gang reality and hoping that they'll, they'll know that the gang violence is about a lethal absence of hope and how do we infuse hope to folks for whom hope is foreign. So I'd done a lot of these and, uh, and I figured maybe I'll do a keynote and so I said yes, I bought my ticket. Well, a week before I was to fly, I pull out the original letter inviting me and to my horror, I discovered that I was to be the only speaker from nine to five all damn day, you know? <laughs> and I remember saying to myself what the homies often say, Oh, hell no, I'm not going to be the only speaker. <laughs> so I get two homies, uh, Andre and Jose, who, uh, you know, are, were in their, like, their ninth month of the 18-month program, and I bring them into my office, and I sit them down, and I said, look, at the end of the week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up in front of 600 social workers and tell your stories. Take your time. Because <laughs> we got a long ass day to fill. Well, I had never heard their stories and Jose gets up first and he's like at the time about uh, 25 years old. Actually, he was in the office today so he rarely comes by. But uh, there he was. And uh, you know, he'd been to prison, tattooed. And, uh, but at that juncture at working at Homeboy, he had become a very valued member of the substance abuse team, a man solid in his own recovery. And now, uh, you know, he's helping younger homies and homegirls with their addiction issues. And so not only had he been to prison, he also had a stretch as a homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. So he gets up in front of 600 social workers and he says, I guess you could say that my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasp. And Jose says, it sounds way worser in Spanish. <laughs> and they did what you just did. You know, we, we got whiplash going from gasp to laugh. And then he continued, I think I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California and, and she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door and the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me. And my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, 
I had to wear three t-shirts to school each day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through. Second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking so overwhelmed with emotion and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon Everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is this. If we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded If we want to be faithful and live as though the truth were true and to put things recognizably first, people of faith who do justice want to take seriously what Jesus took seriously. And fortunately for all of us, there are only four things. They're big, but they're only four. Inclusion, nonviolence, unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate acceptance. We take those things seriously and then we will take seriously what Jesus took seriously. I was praying the other day about the Gerasene demoniac and there are three versions in the Gospels and one of them has Jesus encountering this guy who's naked and wild and screaming and Nobody wants to walk down that road because uh, it's scary to be near him. And Jesus looks at him, he sees him, and he says, what is your name? And the guy says, I am legion, you know, which there are a lot of us. But I read a translation the other day that went like this. I am what I am afflicted with. And Jesus asks his name. He sees him, O oh, nobly born, remember who you really are, and the soul feels its worth. It's not about rescuing, it's not about saving, it's about seeing. In the original covenantal relationship, it says, from God to us, as I have loved you, so you must have a special preferential care and love for the widow, orphan, and the stranger. And God has identified these three groupings as folks who know what it's like to have been cut off. And because they have suffered in exactly this way, God thinks they happen to be trustworthy guides to lead the rest of us to the kinship of God, to connection, to acknowledging that we all live in the same house. The poet Wallace Stevens says, we live in the description of the place and not the place itself. And you go from Chapman 
to live in the place itself. Don't settle for a description of it. And so what you choose to do is not shake your fist, but to roll up your sleeves. What you choose to do is not point things out, but to point the way. What you choose to do is not get stuck in moral outrage because it just holds you there and keeps you from moral compass. If we're honest with ourselves, morality has never kept us moral. It's only kept us from each other. Years ago, I was uh, riding my bike in Aliso Village housing projects, and, and I would patrol the eight gangs, you know, and I was kind of talking to eight gang members in a darkened archway near midnight. And I looked over and I could see this guy we all called Bandit. And he's running up to a car to sell crack cocaine, which is what gang members did a lot in those days. And, and then he walked back, he was counting his money, didn't know I had arrived. There I was straddling my black beach cruiser, talking to his homies. I wish I could say he was embarrassed, but he wasn't so much. And he never came to Homeboy Industries until he did. In recovery, they say it takes what it takes, same with gang recovery the death of a friend, the birth of a son, a long stretch in prison. I'm not sure exactly what it took for Bandit to walk through the door, but he did. And so he surrendered to his own healing and he allowed himself to be cherished and he came to terms with what had been done to him as a kid and what he had done. And he found a resilience that allowed him after 18 months to leave us as everyone does. And now the world will throw at him what it will, but this time he won't be toppled by it. And so our employment services people found him a next job so that it's a seamless transition. And so he worked in a warehouse or something. Well, cut to five years later, he was, you know, running the floor and several years after that he was promoted even further and he got married and had three daughters and bought a house. And I hadn't heard from him in a long time, no news is good news with gang members and until he calls me on a Friday afternoon with a little bit of panic in his voice and uh, he says, gee, you gotta bless my daughter. I said, que paso, amigo? is she sick or is she in the hospital? Oh, no, no. On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine my oldest, my Jessica. But she's a little chaparita, a little tiny thing, and Humboldt's far. And so do you think you could give her a blessing before she goes? And I said, oh, my gosh, I'd be honored. Look, tomorrow's Saturday. I have a baptism at 1. Why don't you guys come at 1230? And, and so they show up, Bandit and his wife, and the three daughters, including tiny little Jessica. So I positioned her in front of the altar. I said, let's encircle her. And everybody touch her. Put your hands on her arm, on her shoulder. Go ahead, put your hands on her head. And I tell all of them to close their eyes and to bow their heads. And as the homies say, I do a long ass prayer. You know, I go on and on. And, <laughs> and somewhere in the middle of this prayer, we've all become chiones. We're all, we're <laughs> And I don't know why we're crying exactly, except for the fact that Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except me. Certainly nobody in their families. So, you know, we kind of wipe our eyes and we laugh at how mushy we got. And so to change the subject, I look at Jessica. Hey, what are you going to study at Humboldt College? And she was very quick, forensic psychology. And I go, damn, forensic psychology. And, and Bandit over here chimes in, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. <laughs> and Jessica turns very deadpan and does one of these, you know. And, and he laughs and he says, yeah, I'm going to be her first subject. <laughs> so we go out to the car and big abrazos, everybody piles in the car. And Bandit hangs back and I'm glad he has. And I said, oye, sabes que, mijo? Te digo una cosa, I'm going to tell you something. 
I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become, for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes well up with tears and he says, Sabes que? I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life, a bueno para nada, a good for nothing. I guess I showed them. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. Oh, nobly born. I'm going to wrap this up with a story and then invite you to ask questions or to say anything you wish to say. So brace yourselves. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I spoke in one of those mega churches once, those Christian mega churches. I don't know how I got invited there. It was 10,000 people. And, and it was a big, huge screen and, and uh, and so afterwards, a woman who I, who I don't think she liked my talk that much, and she came up to me and said, oh, your stories are all well and good, you know. <laughs> but the question is, do you bring gang members to Christ? And I said, well, no, they bring me to Christ. She was not thrilled with that answer. And, <laughs> and then she got really flustered, and she goes, here's the real question. How much time do you spend each day at Homeboy Industries, you know, praising God. And I said, all damn day. <laughs> and I don't believe she liked that answer either. <laughs> but it begs the question, you know, what kind of praise does our exhausted God <laughs> have any interest in? So years ago, uh, I was invited to go to my alma mater, Gonzaga University in Spokane. There you go, Zags, go Zags. Yep, they're all three of us, yeah, go, go Zags. Carmichael, you're kind of acknowledging some of it, I'm sure. So anyway, um, and they, apparently they had forced the entire incoming freshman class to read tattoos on the heart against their will. So I figured I should say yes. and so. So I always, I just came back from Boston yesterday with two homies, I always pick homies who have never flown before just for the thrill <laughs> of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. <laughs> and so I, I took two homies, uh, Larry and Mario. And I've done this so many times, and I, you know, you have nervous Nellies, you know, guys who just have never flown and are nervous. Never have I had anybody like this guy, Mario. I mean, it was starting to freak me out a little bit. I mean, he was hyperventilating, you know, <gasps> like that, you know, and, and we hadn't even boarded the plane yet, you know. And so we're at Burbank Airport, you know, which is a smaller airport, and uh, as you know, and um, you know, you don't go to, through that hermetically sealed chute, whatever they call that, and uh, but you walk out onto the tarmac like you're the president, and you walk up the stairs to the front of the plane and the big feature at Burbank are steps to the back of the plane. Big, big uh, plane, Southwest. I'm sitting there with Mario and he's just hyperventilating. Larry is out walking and it's early morning and, uh, and I see our flight crew has arrived and, and there are two flight attendants, females, two of them with very large cups of Starbucks coffee and they're schlepping up the front steps. And Mario says, when are we going to board the plane? I said, well, you know, as soon as they sober up the pilots. <laughs> there, there they go now. Perhaps I shouldn't have said this. So, so we get to Gonzaga, and, uh, you know, the big talk is Tuesday night, thousands of people, and literally, I mean, huge. And, but... What they don't tell you that earlier in the day is they have 94 classes that you're going to speak in. I said, well, you guys speak in them. I, I'm not going to, I'm going to speak tonight. And so they, and they did. They told their stories. Especially Mario was quite terrified, but they did a good job. Stories of torture and terror. And, and if 
honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of either of their childhoods. So the nighttime comes, and you know, I think this was one of the first times I did this. I do this all the time now, but I, I, I said, you guys get up before me. Do, you know, seven minutes each, kind of a snapshot, like you did today, and I'll give my talk, and then you'll be part of the Q&A. Well, they were terrified, especially Mario, but they did a good job. And then I got up and did my thing, you know, and then I had them come up to stand on either side, and yeah, questions. Yes, ma'am, and a woman stands and she goes, yeah, I got a question, it's for Mario. First question out the gate. Well, Mario is a, this tall, skinny drink of water and he clutches the microphone and he, yes, and he's just terrified. And the woman says, well, Mario, you say you're a father and you have a, a son and a daughter, they're about to reach their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes and he clutches the microphone even more intently and he's starting to tremble and, and I, he's getting a hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell he wants to say when suddenly he blurts, I just... As soon as he says those two words, he retreats back to his microphone clutching refuge and now he's really trembling and now I know he's losing the battle with his tears but he wants to get the whole sentence out. I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there was silence until the woman who asked the question stands and she says, why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are gentle, you are kind, you are loving, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand total perfect strangers stand and they will not stop clapping and all Mario can do is hold his face in his hands so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself and they were returned to themselves because it's mutual. And I think that's the only praise our exhausted God has any interest in. That you may be one, Jesus says. God's dream come true is kinship. That we realize in a declarative way that we all live in the same house. Don't settle for the description of the place. Hold out for the place itself. And Chapman is not the place you come to. It was always going to be the place you go from, whether you are a student or not. And you go from here to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. And you will cease to care whether anyone accuses you of standing at the margins. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Thank you very much. I think they have microphones running around, although it's a, it's a pretty, it's not a, yeah, you know. If you want to talk on a microphone, go ahead. If you want to just go like this, I'll go like that, and I'll repeat the question. Sometimes people don't like to talk on a microphone, and I'm happy to uh, 
answer anything that you wish to ask me. Or just, just belt it out. Don't wait for the microphone. Yeah, Homeboy Industries, you know, it, it's, you know, industries, why, why call it that? So we have uh, a bakery and we have a silk screen a place, We've been around for uh, silk screening and apparel and, uh, and uh, embroidery, been around for, you know, 27 years. We have recycling, as Bob mentioned. We have uh, a restaurant in uh, a diner, Homeboy Diner in uh, City Hall, the only place you can get food. There, uh, we have a restaurant at uh, Terminal 4, American Airlines. We have uh, catering, we have a thing called Feed Hope. During the pandemic, we pivoted to address uh, food insecurity. So, um, you know, they produced a half a million meals for shut-ins and homeless and seniors. Even Megan and Harry came to prepare meals one day, which was a kick. And uh, a farmer's market, what am I missing, merchandise? Marcos, am I missing anything? Is that pretty much it? That's it? Okay, thanks. Yeah, recycling, I said recycling. Oh yeah, well that's where we prepare the meals. Yes sir, go ahead. Just holler. Yeah. Hi, Greg. Let's try it again. Hi, Greg. I'm Raphael. I'm the uh, priest here on campus. Oh, okay. And I'd like to welcome you and thank you for your uh, wonderful ministry. Sure. Um, I have just returned from, uh, during the summer, from Guatemala, Honduras, and San Sal uh, El Salvador where uh, gangs have become as powerful a political force as the narco cartels, a force to be contended with in each of these governments and for which uh, families cannot escape because even if they come to Los Angeles, they're tracked down. So I'm just wondering if you could be so kind as to offer some reflection to the gangs which have been uh, deported or imported from or exported, rather, from Los Angeles all to Central America and have become a force really to be contended with. Um, I'm searching for an answer. Yeah, it's very complicated. And, and of course, as you said correctly, you know, MS and 18th Street and Playboys, they were all born in Los Angeles. And then we deported them back to Central America. It's difficult, you know, we've had, we have a lot of part, we have a thing called the Global Homeboy Network. So there are 350 programs, 300 in the country, 50 outside the country, partners with us uh, in this network. Programs that are modeled on Homeboy and, and we kind of help, we gather every summer for three days. And, and uh, so like in Guatemala City, you know, we have tattoo removal and we have, uh, uh, you know, burgeoning uh, attempts to, uh, you know, have enterprises and, and businesses and such. The thing is, everything is about something else. So we always want to head, uh, address things head on, and, except they're all about something else. So the trick in life is to find the something else. It's like 18th century medical history where they, all these people were getting sick and dying and they didn't know what to do, but they did the thing they always did. We're going to address this head on. Doctors, hospitals, medicine, nothing worked. And then quite inadvertently, way over here, somebody stumbled on addressing the water supply and the sewer system, and suddenly these diseases disappeared. It was because they were about something else. And that's always key, because then people want to address things head on. Uh, you know, my alma mater, after uh, uh, it, it had the three-year uh, anniversary of a horrible massacre in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life Synagogue. And my alma mater started a seminar because they wanted to address it head-on, all with good hearts. And so they called the seminar hate. But 
it's about something else. It's about health. Nobody whole or healthy or well or integrated has ever done anything like that in the history of the world. So it's about something else. But we get stuck in moral outrage and we can't get, find our way to moral compass. So a man attacks an elderly Asian woman on the streets of San Francisco and we want to address it head on. Asian hate crime. But everybody knows that nobody healthy, well, whole, integrated has ever done such a thing in the history of the world. It's never happened. This is why we don't make progress, because our diagnosis is so off. None of us are whole until all of us are whole. How do we love each other into wholeness? How do we somehow... At home, and home, homies have taught me this because it's about not getting tripped up by behavior. Everything is about something else. And the homies always say, find the thorn underneath. You think it's about the behavior, but we're, we're not trying to create the behaving community, but the beloved community. And so we don't want to uh, just... Uh, we hope for the day when we stop punishing wound and we seek together to heal it. And that's the hope, and we can only do that if we allow ourselves to get to moral compass. But it's morality that kind of really keeps us from solution, oddly. And we stop at the shaking of our fist, and we never get to the rolling up of sleeves. And we're, we just announce how awful something is. And we think that's moral compass, and it isn't. How do we move beyond? Anchored in two essential truths. Everyone is unshakably good, and we belong to each other. Once we're anchored in that, then we can actually make progress. But it's hard. We get stopped up. And, and if I denounce something, it is about me. But if I try to point the way and try to invite people to their own goodness, and if I love folks into wholeness with an exquisite mutuality, then it is about us. That feels like progress to me. So Homeboy is just does what it does. But it announces a message. What if we were to invest in people rather than futilely trying to incarcerate our way out of everything? But Homeboy wants to be the front porch of the house we all want to live in. And it's complicated there. But this is why you need to go and infuse hope and love where love has not yet arrived and love what you find. And that's kind of an essential piece. But Homeboy Industries has sort of taught me about that, you know? Everyone is born wanting the same thing. We're human beings. We share the same last name, beings. Yeah. Yes, way back there. Go ahead, shout it out, and I'll repeat it. What about the home girls? Um, what about them? No, I'm just kidding. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, it started as Homeboy Industries because uh, in 1988, uh, males made up 97% of gang members were male. So it wouldn't have occurred to us because it was really a guy thing. Now, cut to 33 years later, males make up 98% of gang members. So that ha reality hasn't changed. But at some point, we, we couldn't exist, to, you know, without females there. And so, but it was hard to find because it was only 3% of, of gang members are female. So we changed our mission statement a little bit to include formerly incarcerated. And so that allowed us to have women. 
and women make up like 40% of our trainees now. Um, so if you're a guy, you have to be a gang member to work there. If you're a female, you have to just be a felon. <laughs> That's how you get hired there. You have to have a record of some kind. Yes, sir. This may be the last one because the red light is flashing. Yes, go ahead. Uh, you talk in the book about systemic racism and where it is now. Where will it be in the years to come? Uh, the question is about uh, systemic racism. In my recent current book? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, you know, I, you. you it's a tough thing, you know, because I, I feel like um, what trips us up always is the fact that we think that everything abominable that happens is about rational actors coming from a healthy place. And that almost never happens. And so you want to be able to model, I mean, this is what Homeboy is about. Yeah, it, it's providing a job, and yeah, it's help, helping that person heal. And, you know, an employed gang member may or may not go back to prison. Uh, an educated one may or may not. But a healed gang member will never reoffend. period. So that handles that. But as a model of black, brown, Asian, white, gang members, rivals, guys who used to shoot at each other are now working side by side with each other. And it's not just about gang members. It's about announcing some new way of seeing where we belong to each other. And, but again, what, I, I, it's a good question to ask ourselves. Why is it that we do not make progress? So Matthew Dowd, who has written a book, and, and in it he talks about... Uh, uh, that two-thirds, he says, of the American people do not believe that all men and women are created equal. That may well be true. But what we don't do is we don't get beyond moral outrage with that stat. We say, why is what we ought to do? Do they belong to us? Are they unshakably good? Does anybody healthy, whole, well integrated believe that all men and women are not created equal? No, the answer is no. So it's about health, it's not about morality. It's about wholeness, it's not about hate. And I think somehow, if we can get to a place, otherwise it, it remains about me if it's pure denunciation. But if it's about announcing the beloved community, and we seek to repair severed belonging. It's what happens. One last story. I, I was just in Boston, and a homie Saul was out, and he was had his, uh, taking a selfie, and he had a picture like this, and a homeless guy said, don't take my picture. And, and a homeless guy next to him says, no, he was just taking a selfie. Relax. And Saul walked up to them. And he talked to them. And the guy who was ranting kept ranting and screaming at him. And the guy who was kind of trying to calm him down, he says, don't mind him. You know, we're both crazy. <laughs> and Saul said to these total perfect homeless strangers, you know, I'm crazy too. And I don't know how he did it, but he softened them both into some corner of kinship. And there you have it. Rather than denouncing people for being, I don't know, bad, you insist that we all have the same last name. Beings. Buenas Thank noches. Thank Good you. evening. I have a question. I have a question. Thank you. Bye, boy. I think because of Father Boyd tonight, really, 
all came upon us, and we want to thank you for this wonderful conversation. As we close, I'd like to thank two more people. I'd like to thank my good friend Carmichael Peters, the director of the Honors Program, such a wonderful partner in all kinds of wonderful activities and really a major player for tonight. Thank you, Carmichael. And I want to thank our governor, uh, uh, not the governor of the state, He's a member of the board of governors, I should say, Bob Barry, because Bob has been really the person who has made this happen. Thank you, Bob. In the lobby, Father, jo uh, Father uh, Boyle is going to sign some of his books that you can buy tonight. So please let us all meet in the, in the lobby. Thank you so much very much for coming here tonight. Goodbye. <laughs>